This week on Africa Weekly, we're on board with the Tunisian Coast Guard as it tackles migrants going north and drugs coming south. We meet the Egyptians preparing for the Pope's visit, and finally we pay a visit to a South African animal shelter for abandoned pet pigs. But first, here's a summary of the stories that made the headlines this week. A special appeal court in Dhaka has upheld a life sentence given to Chad's former president, Hissane Habre, for war crimes and crimes against humanity. The punishment is seen as a blow to the impunity that's been enjoyed by repressive African rulers. But the court acquitted Habre of rape. The World Health Organization has announced a new malaria vaccine will be tested in Kenya, Ghana and Malawi. Around 60,000 children will be vaccinated between 2018 and 2020. The injection could provide limited protection against a disease that killed more than 400,000 people around the world in 2015. 92% of the fatalities were in Africa and two-thirds of those were children under five. A Cameroon military tribunal has sentenced a journalist to 10 years in prison for a failure to denounce acts of terrorism. Radio France international correspondent Ahmed Abba was accused of collaborating with Boko Haram and failing to pass on information about planned attacks. Abba denied the charges and said he was tortured for three months by intelligence agents before being transferred to a jail. In a case that's gripped South Africa, a 22-year-old pleaded not guilty to slaughtering his wealthy parents and brother with an axe. Henry Van Breda claims an intruder broke into the house while he was in the bathroom. Conservationists in Kenya are hoping a pioneering IVF program using surrogates can help save the northern white rhino. There's only one elderly male of the species and two infertile females left on the planet. But the breeding program requires around 10 million US dollars. Now left with Sudan as the only male uh, left on the planet. He is 42 years old, which for a rhino is extremely old. Uh, probably the equivalent of around about 90 years if you were a human being. Um, he's also unable anymore to mount females even if he was fertile himself and even if the females were able to conceive. Plus we've got the two remaining infertile females. Hundreds of gold diggers have descended on an area south of Niamey in Niger, hoping to strike it lucky after hearing reports of gold discoveries in the area. Those hopeful for a nugget or two gathered to collect and sift sand. The 25th edition of the St. Louis Jazz Festival opened in Senegal amid tight security following recent jihadist attacks in cities across West Africa. US jazzman Marcus Miller headlined on Tuesday an emotional return after skipping the event last year. Tunisian coast guards on the lookout for smugglers. This is a new phenomenon and one that's growing. Traffickers take migrants and cheap cigarettes from North Africa to Italy. Then they pick up drugs and take those back to Tunisia. We've thwarted operations that involve Tunisians coming from the north of the Mediterranean. They come alone and we find cash and cigarettes. These are the kind of things that happen. The Coast Guard say a major international network is behind the operation. In March 2017, they seized more than 31 kilograms of cocaine, worth some $6.4 million. Following this operation and our investigations, and because of this new phenomenon that has emerged mostly within the past year, we're planning more operations because similar quantities are being smuggled, so we need to adapt to this new danger. Six years ago, a revolution in Tunisia unseated strongman President Zine al Abidin Ben Ali. Since then, smugglers have strengthened their ties between Tunisia and Italy. There was a sort of tacit agreement between smugglers and people close to the former regime. 
Smuggling routes were well known and monitored by those who were close to the regime, so there was no smuggling of drugs or weapons. It was almost a condition of this unspoken contract. Another fear is that these smuggling routes could also be used for trafficking arms and the smugglers' infrastructure used for terrorist operations. Yet another challenge for the country, which has been struggling to reach political stability since the Arab Spring. Final rehearsal for the choir in this Cairo church. Catholic worshippers are eagerly awaiting the arrival of Pope Francis on Friday. The two-day visit to Egypt will be his first to the Arab world's most populous nation, where 90% of people are Muslim. We started preparing about a month ago when we heard about the Pope's visit and when we found out that our choir had been chosen to take part in the ceremony. Pope Francis's visit is particularly symbolic after deadly attacks against Egypt's Christian community. On April 9th, Palm Sunday, two suicide bombings claimed by the Islamic State group killed 45 people in two Coptic churches. Egypt deserves to receive some support, especially given everything that's been happening and the criminal and terrorist attacks in the country. Of the 9 million Egyptian Christians, just 270,000 are Catholics. The small community hopes the Pope's visit will strengthen dialogue with the Muslim authorities. The visit is very important to consolidate interreligious dialogue, which had been interrupted for a long time. But Pope Francis has revived it. It will be 17 years since the last papal visit to the country by John Paul II. The climax of Pope Francis' visit will be a mass at a Cairo sports stadium. All pigs are equal, but some are more equal than others, like favorites Michael and Misty. They're among almost 300 pigs at this animal shelter north of Johannesburg. Leslie Giles founded the center in 2004 to rescue dogs. But she's been inundated with pigs sold to buyers who were promised they were from the miniature teacup breed. At the moment we have 271 pigs here in residence. Um, and we, we, cannot, we cannot take in the, the amount. We need more pig rescues out there, we do. Marlene Vandenberg is one of those who was duped into buying a so-called teacup pig, a breed that doesn't actually exist. She was shocked when her hog, Bacon, wouldn't stop growing. And they're cute and adorable when they're that young. And then, yeah, they grow up like everything else grows up, and then people abandon them. Leslie uses the salary from her day job as a casino manager to feed and shelter the pigs. But despite her best efforts, she feels like some animals will never recover. I've actually seen pigs turn their faces to the wall and refuse to eat and literally die because they miss their families and they're hurt. They call their, 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 their families are they hurt. They don't understand why they're being abandoned. They don't understand why. It doesn't matter that they've come in with a whole lot of other pigs. Their family was their herd and now their families just left them. It's, the depression in pigs is a real, very real thing that sanctuaries have to deal with. At least these particular pigs won't end up on somebody's plate as pig in blanket. In fact, we they're go. treated so well here, they sometimes end up as pig in sheets. Next week on Africa Weekly, we meet the Senegalese women who are clubbing together in so-called tontine, often to finance small business ventures. That's all from us at Africa Weekly. Until next week.